Mark's presentation is uh, mysteriously titled Beads of Reality Drip from Pins, Bricks in Space. So over to you, Mark. Great. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm still morning. Uh, any talk, you have to think about who to thank. And of course, because I've been doing this for so long, the number of people is uh, quite listy. Uh, but I definitely want to thank program managers at all the government offices. We don't think about them very often. but. They do an amazing job in the background pushing researchers forward while also getting the results they have to get to keep the money coming in. So um, all the different government labs that have funded it, of course, Ian McDowell, the Institute of Creative Technologies in USC, and now Microsoft. So I owe a lot to this <coughs> conference. This was the first stereoscopic displays and applications. I think I went to the second one. And I, everybody in here knows that just that joyful feeling you get when you look at a stereo display. There's just something that feels good about it. And um, this conference has provided a venue for people to publish works that are sometimes ahead of their time, maybe not ready for academic publication, but that still retains thinking about that joy of what it's like to experience it. At this time, I was uh, working on the boom that came out of the NASA Ames Research Center. It was a stereoscopic head coupled display. And Eve Zobish was a researcher at uh, SRI. Ian had built a model for her, and she was trying the boom out in a separate room. And she screamed in the room, and I went running in thinking that maybe she'd gotten hurt or something. And she had found a binding site in a protein she was looking at. It was like a 3D divot. And the amazing thing was that she had spent the prior year using a stereoscopic flat screen system. But when she could start moving around the molecule, seeing all those different 3D points around it, she got a visceral understanding of the molecule and could find that binding site. Of course, from a sales perspective, that wasn't a very good thing because she had found her binding site and now she was done. So with that, we started the Engineering Reality of Virtual Reality Conference, really wanting to see, well, what's that next step? And I've always looked at it as we use the stereoscopic displays, but then we use them to create maps of reality. And that's what she had done with her molecule. In this talk, I'm going to be quoting from two people. One is a book you wouldn't think of, which is Deep Survival. Uh, if you read this man's work, I thought I was going to read it and learn about lots of knives and cool things to buy, so when I go out in the wilderness, I'll survive. And really, all of his books are about a zen-like mindset that you need, because it isn't the equipment you have. It's not panicking and freaking out. And what he distills that down to, the way I think of it is, you, you, you're the, the river's over there and you keep walking and the river's over there and you keep walking and suddenly you realize, where's the river? I don't, uh, and then you look around and nothing's familiar. And at that point, you don't have a map of reality. You don't know where you are. And a lot of people will freak at that point. And as he points out, it's admitting that you were lost is difficult because having no map, being no place, is like having no self. It's impossible to conceive. The people that survive tend to have a common pattern, and one example he gives is a woman sits down in the forest, completely lost, freaks out, and then looks at a flower in front of her and goes, well, there's a gorgeous flower, look at the colors. And then from there she realizes, oh look, there's flowers all around me. Oh, there's a tree. What she's doing is she's starting from scratch, building a map of reality from what she can observe around her. By the way, this is a really useful technique when you go into the business world and you think you're completely lost and you just have to stop and go, wait a minute, what do I know? And you sort of build a map of reality out from there. So she did that from her one point in space. I was driving down the 405 freeway and looking at this tanker truck in front of me, that's my car and the reflection back there. And I don't know how many people in here do that, but pretty quickly you can look at that reflection and pretend like you're driving your car is from the third person and that you're sitting on the truck and then you're driving your car like in a video game. And you kind of do it and you're like, well, I'm driving fine. You're not sure how long you should do this for. Has anybody done that? Is that okay? No, no, just you. All right. Well, what I'm doing there is I'm basically moving my reality from being inside the car to being up on a little tiny point right there on the tanker truck. That is what I mean by pinprick in space. That spot is where my reality is now coming from, and I'm driving my car from it just fine. So each of you has a little bookmark, and it's got a pinhole in it, and you're not going to see anything you haven't seen before in a pinhole. I realize for this conference how, how wrong of me to not pass out two for every person. Um, but the point is that each of you has a pinhole if you stay perfectly still, and you're creating a map of this room. 
None of us have the same reality, none of us have the same map. And between all of them, we have a more complete map of this room. It, that's where reality precipitates from, is those little pinpoints. Now, being stereoscopic displays and applications, of course, we have two pinpoints, and from that, we're going to build the room. And that's what a lot of our papers are about, is just, look, if you have two of these spots, you can do a lot more. Just one more spot. To me, the engineering reality of virtual reality was about, oh, and you can move the two spots around. You can move around that molecule left and right. And it's from that that we create some abstract form of reality in our minds, where we think surfaces are, by, by triangulating on these points and doing all that just from these little pinholes. In my talk, I'm going to talk about mapping reality, inferring it, how we can distort it, and then how we understand it. So just when you think you've come up with something smart, you find somebody that did it in 1950 or before. Um, James J. Gibson is a psychologist that I'm sure everybody's familiar with. I was not. And indeed, he came up with the same idea of the crucial mechanism in depth perception is the changing flow of relationships among objects and their surfaces in the environment that the perceiver moves through. It's perceived through changes in what he called an optic array. The optic array is my matrice of pinholes that I'm trying to think of here. Now, that optic array is really just a light field camera. And again, an old paper, oh, I don't have the date there. Gershon, he's a long time ago. Oh, 1936, there it is. Um, he described that radiance is a function of position and direction in regions, and pretty much laid out what is a light field, uh, a light field. From that, you can start thinking about light field cameras. This one from Lavoie and Hanrahan, where they've just got an array of cameras, or in my way of thinking, an array of pinpricks. Now, there's an, light fields aren't as complicated as they seem. Uh, one way to think of it is, okay, you've got a lens, and the lens has got little prisms, and that prism takes that beam of light and shoves it to that focal point, and that prism doesn't do anything, and it lets it straight through. So a light field lens is really just each one of these points, each one of these pinholes, so to speak, on a normal lens, does the same thing, but because I've got an array there, I can decide I want that angle of light, or I could decide that I wanted the light that came from that angle or that angle. So to me, a camera ray is just a really fancy angle picker along a virtual lens. And you can do really cool things with angle pickers. So it's a little bit small, but this is a picture of a plant. And behind the plant is a little uh, toy statue of David. And of course, you can barely see it there. But if you were to take multiple views from multiple angles, then all of a sudden you can do confocal imaging, this uh, work by, done by Mark Lavoie, and you can see the statue behind the plant. Now, in photographic terms, that's not really hard to think of. If you had a lens that was as big as that light field camera he's got, then you've got an aperture that you can make really small, or a focal plane that you can make really small, the really big aperture, and as a result, all that's really happening here is you're focusing down so everything's out of focus other than the statue, and you can see behind bushes and things. Now, you can reverse this. In this case, it's a light field projector rebuilt. And it's just like a light field camera, except that those are all little micro projectors, and those are lenses. And you can invert the math all of a sudden now to do something, for example, that you only project a focal plane on the object, so everything else is fairly diffusely focused. Or you can do masks. As a result, here's an object, a little figurine behind a plant. And you can light it so that you're just lighting the figurine. The reason I think light fields are so neat is because they've got one of those physics things where you can make uh, uh, one thing equivalent to the other by transforming it. If, if you've got an object, you can, if you can just draw a can around that object, and then on that can say, OK, well, from here, that point on the can had better show me that brightness pixel. But from here, that point on the can had better show me that brightness pixel, then you can effectively duplicate any object with just that description around the can. Lenticular lenses are a subset of that where you've got a sheet in front of it and you're asking yourself the same question. So a light field projector is just a really fancy lenticular sheet in, in a way of thinking. But what's really cool is once you have that math, you have the object. So an example of that is here. It's work uh, done with Paul Debevic, where that's a 3D object and we shoot it from every angle. But to the left is it being shown in a light field projector. And you can compare the two. Of course, we don't have color in that one. 
And you can see that, okay, I've got a description of the object, and I can see it from any angle. Now that one, the can analogy is pretty apropos. Um, that's the can. You have a spinning mirror, and you have a projector that's wicked fast that Ian worked on. It's like 10,000 frames a second. And as a result, for any point on the surface of that can, I can change what each angle sees. Uh, this is just some more of the work. Now, uh, Paul and the crew went on to, we built lots of different ones that were beyond what this one does as well, but this is still my favorite. This is the mirror coming up to speed, so it finally synchronizes with the DLP projector. And here we are walking around it, and sure enough, it's like that head is in there. Now, left and right, we have, we have uh, I won't go into the details, but I, we don't have vertical parallax, but we'll trick it in a second. Ten minutes. Yep. Thank you. You can have interactive manipulation because you're rendering it. Of course, the math there is you have to figure out what all those vectors are on that can, so that's a lot of math. But if you can render it in real time, then you can cheat vertical par parallax by tracking where the user is. Not a bad trade-off, because it's just we all stand at a certain height, and we can't really get much closer than shoulder to shoulder. So there's a couple interesting things. One is, all right, so the pinhole array model, this pin pricks in space, makes sense. As you move left and right and up and down, you have these different viewpoints, and I had better have the right reality for you at each one of those viewpoints. But also, there's little tiny pin pricks across the pupil of our eye, or as our eye rotates, there's one there and one there. So technically, if I really have a light field, I should have to focus on it, because the difference between those tiny pin pricks next to each other matters. And we looked for that, and sure enough, that display did have it. Um, because we don't have vertical perspective, we don't have any difference in the rays in that, in that axis. So as a, result, oops, as a result, along the horizontal axis, we got the focus change you would expect. The objects were as far back as they were. But in the vertical axis, they were focused as if they just were on a piece of paper. So these pinpricks can be really close, and they can be really far. But we infer reality. Now, now I want to talk about its reality. So it's what's in our brains. There is no reality. And Gibson points this out in, one of his, in his 1979 work. He asks the reader to suppose that the concept of space has nothing to do with perception, i.e. that it's out there. Geometric space is a pure abstraction. It's a myth, a ghost, a fiction for geometer, geometers. Reality doesn't exist. There's all this data out there, but it's from that data that my brain decides what is reality. And here's an example I really like, which is that we can do confocal imaging in our brains. We do it all the time. If you walk past a picket fence, you are effectively creating a synthetic lens that's as large as you walk, and you're using that image to look behind the fence. It's just this but I'm doing it in my head because our brains are light field processors. What's really neat is cinematographers do it all the time, but not the way you would think. This is an example from a fight movie where they go up a spiral staircase, but at the end of watching the scene, I have this complete feeling for the volume of space. Just play it again. You never see the fact that there's a lobby down there to the right, but because they've decided to use pinholes in this circular array, this helix that goes up, I feel the space to the right. I have walked that whole helix. And they've done it with 2D images just by choosing the array of pinpricks that they want. And then they let my mind reconstruct the reality from it. You never saw anything to the right. And then they're blatant about doing it. <laughs> Uh, from the Matrix movie, we all of a sudden started seeing commercial movies that use literally an array of cameras, an array of pinpricks around the user. And from that, we create this light field-like image in our minds, but again, from 2D images, because our brains can do it. Oh, and because you have to make sure to do things like this in presentations, and this was done ahead of that movie by Paul Lubevic in his work at Berkeley. So it's neat to think that we have this mobile platform of two pinholes that we carry with us everywhere we go. 
This is just me shooting video walking down the road at, uh, at Microsoft. And look at the amount of vertical bounce I got going on. Look at the disparity between that thing and the far field pole. I've got one wicked light field camera that I'm carrying with me, and that bounce you don't recognize when you're walking, but it's there and you're processing it. And now I have to ask a favor. In this conference, probably at that first one or second one, somebody presented a video called the jogging, jogging stereo effect. And he did this where it alternated between uh, ver vertical points, and the th thing totally looked 3D, and he had another one that was inside a baseball stadium, I think it was. He did the same thing, and the minute you would watch it alternating, the crowd just popped out in space. Does anybody know who that was or what it was? The jogging man stereo? Maybe, I don't remember. Would, all right, if you'd please come up to me afterwards and give me the names, because I really want to find that reference. It was formative to me. All right, so head-mounted displays, if you want to look at them this way, are just a really efficient way of feeding visual information into our two little pinholes here, everywhere we look and go. As a result, they let me sweep my little pin bricks through space, and they give me the right images doing it. Now, it sounds simple, it's not. And uh, since I'm at Microsoft now, I have to uh, talk about their technology because it's fun. So I'll do that now. But the point is that it's a really low cost way. It's like carrying all these pinholes with you everywhere you go. So Holland's got some cool stuff in it. Um, in particular, this is the display portion. That's the display engine, and then these are the waveguides. Um, this. Uh, you know, shoots some images down into the waveguides, it bounces around, and then it comes out of the waveguides. In particular, the, the display is really cool because it's like that big. And it's got some, one of the cool things about it is it's got some really high numeric aperture lenses. So as a result, it can resolve down to individual pixels. That hall lens it has a narrow field of view, but what you really want to do when you look at it is see the resolution it's got. It's down to 1.8 arc minutes. And that enables us to do things we haven't done in these sorts of displays before. In addition, it's got three different waveguides on it, one for each color, and the light from the projectors uh, comes in, I'm sorry, light from the projectors comes in, bounces around, and then you've got this surface relief grading that then has it jam out at all the right po points and increases the exit aperture. So from that deep survival book, it says the organism's survival depends on a reasonable match between mental maps and the environment. As the two diverge, the hippocampus spins its wheels and the amygdala sends out alarm signals even as the motivational circuits urge you to go on and on. The result is vertigo, claustrophobia, panic, and wasted motion. This is what bad tracking in a head-mounted display does. You can think of bad tracking as being a mismatch between the mental map of reality that the rendering system has and the mental map of reality that you have. When those two things don't match, your reality doesn't make sense. When your reality doesn't make sense, you don't like the world. So the HoloLens, more important to me than the displays, was its ability to create a map of its reality. It does that by using these four cameras and grabbing feature points. So this is a paper written by George Klein. Uh, I lost it in on that one a while ago, more than six years. And by grabbing these feature points in the real world, and then correlating between them, just doing stereopsis, just like humans do, you can decide where all those points are in space. From that, you can do a type of slam mapping that means you know where you are and you know where things are. Now that's made better by doing it the same way humans do. If you put an inertial measurement unit in there, just like we have an inertial measurement unit in our heads, then you can clean up the data, make sure that it tracks, make sure that if it takes you a little too long to process, you just use the inertial data and the in-betweens. And because you've got a big old cloud and computer behind this thing, you can start keeping track of these points over time and overlaying maps on top of each other. So here the person's walking from one room to the other and it knows, oh, I think I've been in this room before. Oh, I think I've been in this room before. So it can tie all these little slam uh, sets of points together. Thank you. So one thing, and this is, it's an advertisement, but it's not. You can get a subset of this for 200 bucks. 
These displays that came out last holiday, and there's another set that uh, Samsung did this year, have two of these cameras that HoloLens uses and do this form of slam mapping. And it is now available. You can go to GitHub, and the code's open, some of the code is open for it. So you can start playing with some of the CV technology and other things that are going on. 200 bucks, and you got a great tracker. So this is the, you don't totally recognize it, but that's Studio A, I think, uh, the building I work in, or Studio C. Um, you can start tying together all these feature points as you go, and you can create this huge map of the entire environment. And again, what I like to point out is it seems pretty amazing when a computer does it, but we create a reality like this in our brains all the time, and we store it as well as we walk through these spaces and we are creating maps. But our maps can be distorted. Our reality is really easy to fool. In Deep Survival, he points out it's simple. All you have to do is fail to update your mental map and then persist in following it, even when the landscape or your compass tries to tell you you're wrong. And we love doing that. So as a result, when you have virtual worlds, there's all sorts of fun stuff you can do to distort people's reality, which can serve purposes. This is a redirected walking uh, study done by Evan Suma at the lab. And in it, the person walks through an S-shaped path, or they think they are in the virtual world, but the red is what they're doing in the real world. Rather than having them walk on an S, they're actually walking in a figure eight, round and round. As a result, uh, in, f in a 40-foot space, we can just keep sending them around the figure eight, and they think, I say 400 foot, but it's infinite. You can make them think they're walking in an S-shaped path forever. I'm particularly proud of this experiment because I suggested the figure eight, and the reason I'm proud of that is because if you do a figure eight with your cables, they never kink, because you do one hand and then you do the other hand, and that's why we did it. There's another redirected walking experiment that Evan did that I just think is fun. You're in a building, and as you walk through the building, see, he's gonna hit the wall there. So, oh, this is the way the hallway goes. There's no reason to know. If you can build the geometry just in time, you can build it around where the user is in the space. And here, if he comes to the end, well, quick, put a door to his right, and now that'll make him turn that way. And it's a way, as long as you don't have to have an absolute frame of that building, i.e. a predetermined geometry, excuse me, then you can have a person walking through a building forever. It'd be great in a, in a video game, for example. So here he's gonna hit the wall up at clip tag. He's gonna hit the wall, boop, there's a door. I'd like to talk again about um, how we can distort reality. So this is a machinist block. It's a metal block and it has these holes drilled all the way through it. It's about that deep. So if you look at it with a real eyeball, with your pinhole, that's what you're gonna see because perspective's gonna black out those holes. They're over here. But you can see straight down the tunnel in the middle. In another project done at ICT, we looked at um, ways to render uh, objects. And the right way to do it is, let's say you shoot a 360 degree ring of, of images around the object that's there. Then you've got the right pinhole math around this, this cylinder, but you don't have it for there because you didn't happen to shoot that picture. But you can use some math to rebin an image by taking a little bit from one, a little bit from the other, and you can decide what that pixel should have been, and that's called rebinning. That's what we've done here. But it's expensive. You have to do all that math. Or you can just cheat and say, well, that eye is pretty close to that eye at that point, and that eye is pretty close to that eye. So no, the angle of that ray is not quite right, but I'm just going to go ahead and grab the nearest images. What happens is you get geometry that lies. Here, all of a sudden, I can see through all the holes. The perspective is wrong and it should have looked like that. But again, we distort reality all the time. Here's what the original image looks like, and this, I'm sorry, this is what it looks like when you do it the wrong way in, in the video you're about to see, and this is what it looks like when you do it the right way. The nose has got different lengths. But one of the interesting things was, one of the perceptual things we love to do is recognize faces, and we'll recognize a face uh, even if it's inside out. We also found that stuff like that worked in the demo. Oh, this one's got uh, fun to sound, if you can bring up the sound. I right, was supposed to say that. Sound's not actually important, though. There we go, it's just fun. It's a wake up at this point in the presentation. So here we're, sh ooh, boy, I blew that. The laser button is too close. 
So there's the object. We wanted to work with stop, stop motion artists and see what that kind of content looked like in virtual worlds. I'm tired of just flat polygons everywhere. So here the artist takes a maquette, changes it, moves it, and there it is in the virtual world. And you can see where, okay, so his nose isn't right. Really? Do you care? So we found that we could get all sorts of amazing specular reflections and transparency. You can see the little hole in there, translucency. You could have students come in and do clay pieces, and all of a sudden students could be participating in this new medium by using tangible media in their hands. And this work really comes from the perspective of, I don't need polygons, I don't need traditional rendering techniques, I'm just going to find a way to feed those two pinholes with the right images when I need to. So this is a form of image-based rendering that totally circumvents the need to do geometry. Another place you can distort reality is in the field of view. So this was an interesting study done by... Yeah, his name's going to pop up, up, proper noun, Flux. Um, this is a 140 degree field of view display. Uh, Ian did this at Fake Space, it's the wide five. And this is your typical back then 60 degree field of view display. Now there's a thing in virtual reality where we will distort distances. If you ask somebody how far down is that spot, they'll say, okay, I can walk to it, it's 10 feet. If you stick them in a head mount, they'll walk to it and they always walk shy. And there's a lot of explanations why, nobody's totally proven why. The way I feel is like, I know it's not real, maybe I'm gonna hit it and I slow down. But uh, it's hard to prove exactly why people do that, but dist uh, distance estimations being too small is a common problem in virtual reality. What this study showed was that, hey, if I give you a wider field of view, that's the red, the black line is what it should be if it was perfect. The red line is what you get if you get a wide field of view. The blue line shows that you're underestimating the distance with a narrow field of view. So the more field of view you've got, the better. And I believe it's because, well, I can see my periphery, I can see my ground, I, feel, I know where I am, because that's what I'm using my periphery to figure out. What was interesting was that we did another experiment where we had the same 60 degree field of view, but we just put a border of white light. So you just had light out in the periphery. You didn't actually see any optical flow. And that's the green line it got really close to doing as well as the actual wide fives, 140 degree field of view. So there's something about just you getting information in your periphery, knowing that it's there and not changing that counts. And that's where this, these pinholes start getting complicated. We think of them just as being geometry, but they're sensing all sorts of stuff. One of those is change. And it may not even be having enough resolution to tell you where something is, but it can tell you if something changed. So th if, um, you try to stare right there and just you know, do that thing where you stare and things disappear. You'll totally see that we can bend space. The grid starts looking square across the whole thing. But if I change something in the periphery, you can notice that. Is that does that work at those distances? Yeah. Great. So these pinholes, don't think of them as just being visible pixels that have a brightness value, or I guess you can, but that brightness value is over time. There's lots of other information in there that we're using to build our maps. So what's this all good for? Well, in the end, we're using all of it to understand reality, and I'd like to sort of transition to a different part of the talk now on that front. When I got to Microsoft, I was in charge of the design of the shell for those VR displays. So you start asking yourself, okay, this is gonna get shipped in volume to lots of people. This is sort of gonna be their reality. What does it need to be? And then you look at what people are buying and what consumers are doing and, and how they're gonna, uh, it's responsibility is what I'm trying to say. And then I look at what people are doing today with technology. It's like, what, what is the mental map here? I don't know that people with their cell phones and everything that's going on with them that's digital are in the world at all. I'm saying that we're creating a mental map from pinholes in space, but actually there's a whole other set of data we're using to create these maps of reality, and that is the information coming to us from, from technology. And I don't like it. Mobile phone, but, but on the other hand, mobile phones let you do so much. They've got these affordances. I can call my friends. I can, I can do calculations. I can find out the weather. I, I mean, they are just amazing little bundles of affordance. 
So what's wrong with that? I want all those affordances. So it makes sense that they're dominating our model of reality, but they just suck. They just don't, they're just not how I want the world to grow up. A forklift doesn't suck. A forklift, when you use it, is just an empowering experience. It gives a sense of satisfaction, and that's what I find missing from mobile devices. Phones kind of say, well, it did that. Right? It, it found the data for me. In real life, you do it. I found the data. And where I believe virtual and mixed reality can go is that you feel like you did something beyond what you normally could do. So it goes from it did that, I want I did that, to I did that, because you can do amazing things in a virtual world. The best user interface, my platonic ideal user interface, is the Buchla 200 synthesizer because I spent so many hours behind it. But knobs and patch cords work. You feel like you're working, and you know it's over there, and you get kinesthetic understanding of the space around you. That, to me, is the platonic ideal because humans are incredible machines the way we can harness the, the dexterity of our fingers. We can tell thousandths of an inch. We can move things. We can use the power of space and feel personal satisfaction from doing it. So sure enough, Gibson figured that out too, which I'm reading him more, and then I'm like, oh, great. And in fact, I don't know if any of you know it, but the word affordance Gibson came up with, um, that, was, that was out of his work. And what he says is, well, how do we go from the surfaces of the earlier pinhole model to affordances? The composition and layout of surfaces constitute what they afford to us. So if so, to perceive them is to perceive what they can do. It's not enough to just think of the world as a bunch of geometry. We are constantly remapping it as, and that geometry can do this for me. I can do that with it. I cut out the slides, and I have to admit that the HoloLens goes one step further in order to find these surfaces. It has a depth sensor, and that uses time of flight. Now, it does it from a pinhole, but it's starting to look at actually the phase of the light that comes back. And when I talk about light fields, I've completely lied, right? Because I'm not actually talking about the phase of the light. So the HoloLens goes the next step with a depth, depth sensor that actually can look at the phase relative to the output phase and start determining depth to surfaces. Users feel a visual with connection that, with their virtual With that, there's some things hand. you can do. Now, and a this work uh, uses the connect depth sensor, but it starts looking at affordances and how we can use our hands devices. to manipulate the world. Represent a robust, efficient, long and short range hand tracker, which while just another step towards this goal, has allowed us to prototype new experiences which help us to envision this radically new future. It's getting pretty cool what you can do with it. Um, this is a research paper not necessarily tied to the HoloLens where you can take a ring on and off and it'll track it. So our reality is Again, more than geometry, it starts becoming surfaces, how they feel, tactility. And the next step you start realizing is actually understanding the space around you. Uh, this was a research paper at CVPR that looks at semantic segmentation. They don't say if possible affordances, but that's how I look at it. It's deciding that, well, that's probably a couch. That blue stuff is probably a floor. It's starting for the machine to understand reality, just as the machine has to understand the geometry of reality to track you. We're starting to go into an era where the, our, our software, is, it's not going to be enough to draw it. The software needs to know what those things are. I love it because it looks like meaning is sort of slowly suffocating space. Right now, you can download an app on the iPhone called Seeing AI, and that will explain the world around you as well. It will uh, you, it'll recognize friends if you've preloaded them. It'll roughly tell you their facial expressions. If it's a stranger, it'll tell you how old he thinks the person is and whether or not they're smiling or, or intensely focused. If you hold it up to text, it'll read the text aloud. If you have an iPhone, you should download it and just carry it with you for a day. It's really fun to see what it can and can't do. But it's another example of how our world is starting to merge where the machine understanding and our understanding of the world are coming together. So what does this mean for my design task? From Deep Survival, it says, um, you know, he pulled himself together, he made a fire, he built a makeshift shelter using his garbage bags, he stayed put and adapted to the environment. Having faced the reality of his situation, having created a mental map of where he was, not where he wanted to be, he was now able to function. The important word here for me is situation. 
When you have a collection of affordances in space, those are the three things I've been talking about affordances and I've been talking about space, you suddenly find yourself in a situation. So to design this mixed reality shell, I wanted to look at, well, what are situations that uh, people thrive in? What are situations in the real world that we like? And then in those situations, you, you quickly realize that a situation is made up of people, places, and things. They can be real and physical, or they can be virtual. But this is this weird world of mixed reality where we're having mixed reality situations. So here's an artist studio. You can do highly parallel thinking there. It's an extremely spatial environment. Uh, recording studios, which goes back to my Buchla synthesizer, Holy Grail. They're highly productive environments, and you're very instinctual and spatial. You just know the knob is over there and over there. You can have highly personal situations, uh, rooms that are set up to reflect somebody. They're very satisfying. And then you say, OK, well, what are, the situa what are people place thing combinations, and what situations do they create? So uh, kids in a ball in open space, you just, if you just put those things together, kids will create a playful situation. If you're by yourself, you got a backpack and you have some nature, you can create a tranquil situation. And of course, the one that drives me the most, and I find most of my motivation and core, core desire in life, is you get people and documents in a conference room together, you have a collaborative situation. That was a joke. Um, but the point is that we're doing this. This is what we do in reality. We're creating situations. We've created a situation here today, which we spent a lot of money to create, to have us together in a conference setting with information being presented, the ability to talk afterwards. This is what people do in fine tune. So I posit that in the, in the late 60s, documents became the paradigm. Um, and it's neat when you start looking at computers as being document synthesizers, like, a, like an audio synthesizer, you can synthesize a document, but now it's electronic, so you can store it, you can modify it, you can save it and have multiple copies with differences. It's really powerful when you have a document synthesizer. I claim that mixed reality is basically a situation synthesizer. All of a sudden, you can create situations for any task you have at hand or that you want to have at hand and experience it. And we went through to test it. I, uh, we went through a whole bunch of statements that were made about documents back then. I can sort and group documents and data. Well. I can sort and group data in a situation. I can work with colleagues remotely on documents. I can use a situation to bring colleagues together. It has a lot of parallels, but now it's one step further and closer to reality being around us. So from a design perspective, my challenge is I believe that space is the medium we can design in. Instinctual affordances are the means we get things done with. And satisfaction should be the goal. And by doing this, the, the way we design the shell, I think of mixed reality as a situation synthesizer. So the design turned out, if you go buy one of these, this comes with it in Windows. It's really cool, just standard Windows. You plug the head mount in and it just works because it ships as if it's Windows. The shell is really just a house. And in it, you can do collections of people, places, and things to create the situations you want. We had architects help design where each room has very different feelings, so they imply, well, this might be the kind of situation you want to create here. There's a media room, for example. But the other cool thing is they run uh, the, uh, a, type of Windows, uh, a type of Windows code where like, your photos viewer will just show up because all your photos are there. So you can start assembling these intelligent objects that have behaviors that you would expect to create the situations that you want. Moving away from that a little bit, I want to just point out two things. One is authoring situations is more key, akin to theme park design than to other media. We have a problem where like, film directors at first said, well, I don't get that virtual reality stuff, and they keep talking about it as a storytelling medium. You don't tell a story because the user is as much part of the story as you are. So a theme park or a hike is closer. I climbed Mount Whitney, climbed. I, I hiked Mount Whitney over the summer. And then I read it. I didn't do any research on it. And then I read all these stories of other people doing it. And you know what? My experience that I thought was mine, a lot of people have really similar experiences. But I made that, I, I discovered that story as I went. I chose, I did. The person's personal agency is as much of our map of reality as what any author could do. And it's neat to look at it in two axes where uh, the agency a user feels 
in a book, you don't feel much personal agency, but in a board game, you feel a ton of personal agency. That's all about your choices. And likewise, a book, though, isn't very immersive um, in, the, in the perceptual sense. Um, and cinemas vary. You get big 3D screens. The author can really decide what you're going to see and feel, whereas in a book, they can't. They have to, you have to make it up in your mind. Virtual reality and augmented reality are out here, where all of a sudden, I can make you see and hear things I want, but you are the one that has all the agency. So it really is a new type of medium to author for. And then when authoring this, I want to point out that um, somehow I've gotten louder, I think. I wouldn't mind if it came down just a tad. Thank you. Um, because our situations don't need to follow the rules of physics, what rules do they need to follow? And this is a weird one because I'm saying that we craft this reality based on all the geometry we see from all these holes and what we think we understand. So it has to be real enough that I buy into it. But if you look at a magic realism book, if a superhero has the power of being able to shoot fireballs, the first page I read that, okay, maybe that's kind of funky because people don't shoot fireballs. But halfway into the book, if all of a sudden that person has the power to like make ice, well, that breaks reality. Because that character only shoots fireballs, we all know that. It's the ice character that does ice. So, magic realism has looked at this where you can set up rules that break physics as long as you're consistent with the rules. I tell that uh, the chemistry story, the molecular modeling, there was an interesting rule-breaking thing I learned on that. We went to the American Chemical Society and thought, wow, we're going to sell a ton of these booms because all these molecular modeling people are going to want them. So we made this huge model of, of Taxol, and it was like the size of this room. And you could fly through the model, and aren't the chemists going to love it? They can be in their molecules. And the first day of the conference, people were coming and going, and they just weren't into it. There just was little. They weren't getting it. They weren't interested. So that night, we went back to the hotel room, and we made the model this big, a foot and a half across, just like a ball and stick model they would be used to from the ball and stick learning they did. Now, it hurt me to do that because I got virtual space, all right, would I waste it just on this little teeny tiny model? But we showed that the next day, that they got. Because everybody knows that a virtual model of a molecule is about that big. It's the size of a bread box. So that's a weird one where, okay, reality doesn't really matter here, but your expectation of reality does matter. So we can get surreal with these worlds, but we're going to have to find ways to walk people to what the rules are. And one of the things I'm, I think a lot about is the way we walk culture down the rules now will set the stage for what we're allowed to do later. And I just think a lot about that. Um, also, if you read Mel Slater's work, and if you don't, you should, uh, he has this model of pi and psi, and I, th I believe he predicted what I'm saying right now by saying the illusion of place is what he calls pi. And that was the first part of my talk, which is this way we build place. But the second is the illusion of plausibility, our understanding of that place and is what we do there plausible. A fireball is plausible. I could see that. But a fireball and an ice hand, that's not plausible. And this sounds a little artsy, but in fact, uh, we had Army sponsorship to look at exactly this, which was, can we use surreal environments to better training? Being able to change scale in an environment then enables you, when you go into the real environment, to quickly ask yourself, well, OK, I remember seeing it like this. What's the plan view here? Being able to freeze time is a really powerful thing, where you can stop and pause and ask yourself, OK, what's going on here? The ability to do sort of surreal vision is useful for down-to-earth applications. Uh, this is an example I personally love. It doesn't come across very well. Uh, the, there is audio on this one. Maybe there's not audio on this one. Not that important. This person asks this person for a piece of data, but she doesn't know the answer yet. So she goes into, it's not very elegant yet, but she goes into vamping technology. She says, just give me a second, I need to think about that. And then she thinks. I have an answer to that question now. It's 100 and they will be here next Wednesday. Wonderful. But in fact, what she did was she quickly, she being a virtual character, texted this person who was the expert in that question, asked, is it 10 or 100? That person said it's 10. And then that answer comes back to the avatar. So we can start having these asymmetries in our world. And 
it seems really strange where there's a person that's not there and maybe she's represented by 10 experts for the answer, but it's completely plausible. People all the time in meetings go, well, let me think about that, and then they phase out. The fact that they're then asking 10 experts for the answer, texting it from their phones, and then coming back and answering it, that's okay because it's plausible to us. But we're also gonna have these asymmetries where the reality that person in is nothing like the reality these people are in. But if you take a look at how we're using our mobile devices, we're in asymmetric worlds all the time. Right? Nobody is in the world with you if they've got their phone open. They are somewhere else. So we have to get used to this concept that we have asymmetric realities. But then, if you go all the way back to the pinprick model, that's kind of what we're used to anyways. Your model of this room and your model of this room is completely different. And if you don't believe me, I have a little trick I used to use because I got, when I first started dating my wife, she likes to go out to dinner. Dinners take like an hour. I start getting antsy. So halfway into dinner, we tried switching seats. She, we, I'd just sit in her seat and she would sit in mine. It's like going to a whole new restaurant. It's, y you have to try it. <laughs> You're like, whoa, where, are, where am I? Just by sitting in the other seat. So we are in asymmetric realities all the time. Scott Fisher at USC has got this piece I really love of bringing plausibility. Here's a world, but things aren't making sense because they're falling and it's kind of weird, so you leave. But later in the piece, he has these tangible objects and you use them to summon uh, yokai, which are these little virtual creatures. I believe, there it is. And they're the ones causing all the mischief. When you have this embodied model of somebody else having agency, a little character, then there can be a whole lot of weird stuff going on in your world that you buy into because, oh, well, there's that little spiritual creature doing it. So we're constantly needing to find ways to make plausibility exist, even though the fun part in a lot of this is completely implausible environments. So my fifth point, and it's only got one slide, is we should be enjoying reality. From this conference's perspective, displays and the electronic images they create are a huge driver in the reality our society is creating in its mind. Just look at how much we're staring at screens, for example. So we can either make these light fields have little itty-bitty pupils and uh, distortions, or optical engineers can make it so that the displays just look good, and they've got a nice field of view, and they feel good. Or we can just walk around it, and it works. And likewise, in content, we can either create isolating situations with menus and checkboxes and this way of viewing the world through a logical database lens that, that bends us to the reality of the machine, or, and I hope some of the pieces showed you, we can start bending the machine's reality to ours and making it act in a more human way. Because as long as it's a virtual reality, let's make it a joyful one. There's some papers here and presentations that I'd like to point out. Um, uh, today, you've got a whole bunch of sessions, and, and, and these are things that I think can help along the lines of my challenge there. Uh, there's all these amazing light field papers being kicked off by Paul DeBevic. I haven't seen this one, but I love the title, The Beauty of Light Fields, because there is just something gorgeous. Uh, it's just like that feeling you get from stereo. When you look at a re it, it, there's just something about staring at light fields that is equally uh, enjoyable as staring at a stereo image. And then there's a number of papers in the engineering reality, virtual reality tomorrow, but um, the medical image segmentation is an example. I haven't seen the paper yet, of course, but uh, it's about, well, how are we making sense out of the reality that's there? Uh, ways of, th this one to me looks like a great uh, uh, real-time emergency evacuation of a nightclub disaster. That's a perfect, I need a situation synthesizer here because I want people to be able to think it through. And um, here's a way of doing gesture control where I believe what's going to be looking at is, you know, what is the intent of my gesture? How can this machine understand my reality better? And that's it. Free for questions. Thank you.